Thank you, Kurt. It's nice to be back at MIT. We're going to be talking about uh, solar energy for buildings. Uh, here we are, maybe. There are three 800-pound uh, gorillas that are staring us in the face. I always do this before I get into it because I'm very passionate about it, and I think it requires a higher level of attention than just any other topic. Uh, why efficiency and renewables are not only desirable but are necessary. The first two are pretty well known, peak oil and climate change. The third one is a little bit harder to get your arms around. It's energy security, national security. And I was privileged to speak at a conference where James Woolsey, former director of the CIA, was keynote. And about 20 minutes into his talk, he stopped cold and waited for everyone to stop talking and look up. And he said, energy independence is the most important national security issue facing us today. Stopped again and then continued. Next time you go to the gas station, before you get out of your vehicle, reach over and adjust the rearview mirror so that you can look yourself in the eye because you're about to once again begin to finance terrorism. I thought, wow, that's pretty heavy. How can we get that message across in a little bit more acceptable manner that people would relate to and perhaps even respond to? I was supposed to speak in the afternoon, so I got busy on the Mac during lunchtime, and I figured, best way to do that is with humor. And uh, consumer choice, of course, is a very important subject these days. And so I figured if we're going to be financing terrorism every time we go to the gas station, we should have a choice in the matter. So when you go to the, when you go to the pump and you put your card in, you choose credit or debit. And then you should be able to select which terrorist group you want to finance. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, the market, of course, is, uh, is doing its thing. And uh, if people just subscribe to the free market, the free market is going to make that message as clear as, as it possibly can. These three Gahan Brown gorillas are creating what I call the perfect storm for renewables. I think that's why Noel Brown is heading up the Fraunhofer with so much enthusiasm, because his time has arrived. We're going to go through the various methods, if you will, of incorporating solar in or on buildings, at least the most popular ones, starting with sloped residential and light commercial roofs in no particular order. The roof, of course, is a very good piece of real estate because the area is open. It's elevated around its surroundings. It usually gets good amounts of sun. And so that's where we started. We started with as Kurt mentioned, the first all-solar residence, which was indeed co-sponsored by MIT back in 1979-1980. This was well and truly the first residence to get all of its power from the sunlight that falls on its roof and share a surplus with the utility through a policy which later had become known as net metering. Of course, all of the Efficiency measures are here, super insulation, internal thermal mass, monolithic air and moisture barriers, high efficiency glazing, sun controlling geometry, modest amounts of glass on the east, west, and north, some daylighting. Uh, also operable clear story to provide flow through thermal siphon ventilation. A dual compressor, high efficiency heat pump, no fossil fuel on site, a surplus of energy generated. And this was uh, you know, back a few years ago. We tried to integrate the solar as best we could, but in this case, the hardware wasn't quite available, and so that sits about an inch above the roof. We went further, and this is the first fully integrated one, where the center is solar thermal for direct water heating. Below that, you see a turquoise glass, which is, in fact, heat rejecting, daylighting into the core of the building, and then the left and right wings are integral solar electric. And the three strategies combine to form a single uniform glass plane that makes up the entire south roof. And since then, well, I, I wanted to show you how these things get done. And unfortunately, uh, 
I don't have the time to go through all the details, but basically uh, we were just learning as we were going there and put these modules uh, directly on the roof rafters. And uh, we ended up, of course, designing in the summer and building them in the winter, which wasn't as convenient as it might be, but uh, we knew already that we wanted to cool the array underneath, and so you see the soffits are open with a generous amount of ventilation to allow flow through natural ventilation with a thermal siphon or a chimney effect, and out the back on the ridge is a two-foot high, very low resistance louver. You may recognize these guys. They came by to take a look at how air flows uh, with the TV camera. The home got a lot of attention. Uh, basically, how you'll live in 2012, that was 30 years of projection forward of how technology and design would combine to make energy efficiency commonplace. And I think we're pretty close to that goal. A lot of the innovations have come, of course, from the MIT community. We're grateful for that. This is a pop quiz for those non-technical folks. What's wrong with this picture? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is important because um, Noel asked me to talk about technology improvements, and, and this is just sort of uh, a, a brain fade, but there are devices now that accommodate or at least help to accommodate for shading across solar arrays. We'll talk about some of those. Here's another building fully integrated. The right side is solar thermal about 800 square feet of high efficiency black nickel chrome selective surface absorbers. The two surfaces on your left are photovoltaics. This building makes more energy than it needs in northern New England. Adirondack Museum, uh, fully roof integrated into a historically significant all stone building, structural stone bearing walls and a deep uh, thickness butt slate as the roof. Uh, you can integrate wherever you wish if you're willing to take the time. First commercial scale building we did, Georgetown University's Intercultural Center, Washington, D.C. Uh, this was the first commercial scale building integrated roof, and it's still working to provide large blocks of utility quality power into the campus distribution network some 30 years later. A house which has become famous on the main coast on this Left side, you have solar thermal. On the right side, you have solar electric. The two technologies are integrated to combine to form a single uniform glass plane. The house makes more energy than it needs. It has every year since the owners took possession. And we actually used the site to help this house. You notice that it's on a knoll, and the knoll is clear, and the knoll is covered with snow. And when the sun shines, in the wintertime, it's coming up from the southeast. It bounces off this field of snow, and it gives us about a 1.5x sun pulse in the morning to warm the house up. And then, of course, the, house, the sun moves off axis so that it doesn't overheat. That was free. You see that we are using the modules as the finished skin of the roof. There have been some code issues about this, as you can imagine. It was good to be a pioneer because the first 20 years we were under the radar. There were no codes and we just did what we wanted to do, even in Washington, D.C. This is a fully integrated solar system, in this case thermal, uh, at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. We did three systems down there and uh, the White House architect was pleased. Nobody else asked about it. Flat roofs are another big opportunity to harvest sunlight. Lots of real estate, literally thousands of square miles of sun-drenched roof area begging to be harvested daily. Lots of various concepts and proposals and different designs. This is the PBS affiliate in Boston, WGBH. They asked us to power their new studio over in Brighton. And these systems are now so sophisticated in terms of using the back surface uh, with a wind deflector like the spoiler on a race car to help the system stay on the roof even when winds increase such that you don't have to have any hard connections to the building or any roof penetrations. Innovations in this area, there's a lot of opportunity to get fewer parts and pieces. 
the concept is pretty well reduced to practice, but there's more room for refinement here so that you reduce field labor and still maintain the integrity. You notice that the array is connected, obviously, east-west, but also north-south. So the single, the, the entire array responds to wind loads as a single uniform element as opposed to individual pieces, and that helps to keep it together. More flat roofs. Uh, this is the uh, 96 Summer Games in Atlanta. We were privileged to help power that, the first power, solar-powered Olympics. This was the largest rooftop system in the world at the time. The black bands are solar thermal because the pavilion is the women's and men's swimming and diving facility. We also fielded what was the first application of large area, what we call electric glass, as the solar portal to the Olympic venue. This building, of course, has been re reformed and re renovated or re 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 repurposed, if you will, to become the athletic center on the campus. Closer to home, Tufts University, new residence hall, solar electric on the top picture, solar thermal below. Residence hall, of course, uses a lot of domestic hot water. The thermal collectors have to be up at a steeper angle because you can't store the thermal energy anywhere near as easily as you can the electric. The electric, of course, is stored essentially in the utility grid with net metering. And so you have a steeper angle, and this requires hard connections to the building structure because of the sail factor and wind loads, whereas the solar electric can be done at a much lower or more gentle angle because you can harvest in the summer and essentially carry your surplus over into the winter months when there's less sun, less daylight hours, etc. There are a number of different uh, mounting systems, all of which, uh, or the majority of which, use some type of ballast so that they don't require roof penetrations. There's a lot of room for modification and refinements there. This is a thin film laminate which can be bonded to a commercial roof membrane and rolled out as the roofers are re-roofing or initially roofing the building. It is attractive on a building where you have more roofs than you know what to do with because this tends to be lower in efficiency than the crystalline products and very few penetrations because you can't cut this stuff in the field to accommodate a plumbing vent or a skylight, so you've got to leave large parts of it out. Essentially, one of these elements is the smallest building block, and you've got in the center, lower center, you've got just a little roof drain, and you lose about uh, 200 square feet of roof. And so you can see that it, it works well on buildings that have a lot of roof that are going to be roofed at the time solar is being considered and have very little what we call roof clutter. The opposite end of the spectrum, the highest efficiency monocrystal and solar packed very tight to harvest as much as we can from what was a limited roof. Goodness. Uh, more, more examples. This is a zero net energy building where we purposely designed the truss to get the collector, the uh, solar array up to harvest the maximum amount of energy for the building's footprint. And you see we're actually cantilevered out over the building. Another academic center, Zero Net Energy. This is in Oberlin, Ohio, for Oberlin College. The architect designed the building with the college purposeful desire to have net zero energy, and yet we had a third of the roof facing north in Ohio in the winter. First day on the project, I mentioned to the owners that we weren't going to get to Zero Net Energy. Of course, the architect was not at all happy about that, but you can see the profile of the roof. It was not optimized for solar. It's despite putting the most efficient array we could, we could only satisfy about 40% of the building's requirements. The building was overglazed. There are no thermal breaks in the curtain wall aluminum. And this brings up the importance of whole systems design. You've got to work architects and engineers hand in hand in full collaboration rather than on their own. Three mechanical engineers resigned on this project because they weren't getting that kind of collaboration. And the really good one was they wanted a living machine. A living machine is, of course, processing wastewater with plants and natural processes. And so the program included a greenhouse to have an internal living machine. Unfortunately, the greenhouse was oversized, and the architect said, fill it. And so they did. And there it is, wonderfully resplendent. However, 
it's oversized for the building load. And therefore, it crashes every once in a while. We're not going to make that. And unfortunately, they have to go out for a poop campaign to restart it because there's not enough nutrients to come into the system. This was, of course, a laughing stock for the architects and for the school, and it really underscores the importance of whole building design and whole systems design. To satisfy the other part of the power requirements, we took advantage of an underutilized piece of campus real estate, the campus parking lot for the faculty, and designed a solar canopy. Again, designing in the summer, building in the winter, there it is. That plus the roof capacity provides more than the building requires. There's a surplus that's shared with the utility and we need to use our brains a little more on the whole system side of things. Sunshades, this is the US mission of the United Nations in Geneva. A retrofit, sunshades were perfect because these folks were getting baked with the sun on the southwest facade. SUNY Albany, the first US example of integrated sunshades in the facade. Cape Cod Community College. Uh, this is the US EPA lab, a little bit of a variation on the theme. And even the uh, Major League Sports Stadium has solar sunshades along the port walk. Here's another pop quiz. What's wrong with this picture? Uh, you think so? Yeah, and what really frosts me is that this got all kinds of gold awards and honor awards, and it certainly sends up the wrong message to the practice and the professionals as well as the lay people. Now, there are ways to address this. There are module level inverters that are now coming onto the market <laughs> and they can help to mitigate the shading effects. You want me to stop? All right. Uh, curtain walls and facades, uh, the first solar high rise in Manhattan photovoltaics in the Spandrel and on Vision area, uh, the Tiger Woods Learning Center, thin film photovoltaics as the glazing, University of Oregon, five-story crystalline curtain wall, and some installation pictures. There's a lot of innovation to be done between the curtain wall industry and the solar industry in terms of getting the wiring through the extrusions and getting that code compliant. It's being done in Europe, they're way ahead of us, and that's mainly a policy issue. Also, smaller, or more efficient inverters that can be used on different levels so you're not running wires all over the world. There's a view of that. And here's another, what's wrong with this picture? Same idea. They put the photovoltaics behind this heavy timber frame. You see the shading. This is essentially a non-functioning investment. And it happens more often than you might think. Skylights and overhead glazing. These are the solar canopies for the BP gas stations and convenience stores, daylighting in the REI outdoor equipment stores, solar skylights, and this wonderful project in the Netherlands, a zero net energy fire station. I visited here and I asked them, how could you justify making this wonderful investment in all this solar? And they said, we just kept our old fire trucks. <laughs> And here's one in Germany. Germans, of course, have been leading in innovation here uh, since the beginning. And this is actually coming commonplace now, the solar cafe. Very special array of crystalline solar cells in the glazing where the cells actually transmit sunlight by about 20%. Wrapping up, it's very important to address energy efficiency, of course, in terms of load management. And everybody that is, when I say, is surprised because I'm the most zealous solar advocate you're likely to meet, but I tell everybody that solar is the last thing I want you to do. That's to get their attention and they say, why? And the answer is because if you're trying to get to net zero energy or even to just a good building, the success formula is efficiency, 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 conservation, more efficiency, and then renewables. Thank you very much.